welcome to Sketch Notes, Ira Ariella Key. Um, I just wanted you to talk a little bit about what you do, how your operation works, just exactly what it is and, and why it's different from uh, humanitarian aid, which uh, is on the outskirts, really, of Ukraine. Sure, and very happy to be here. Um, I think that the truth is that Ukraine was not a destination for humanitarian aid until two weeks ago. It was a Western democracy, much like Poland, Slovakia, and indeed not too different from the UK. And so the existing infrastructure does not exist. And there is no precedent for disaster relief workers to be in the UK. There was no need for them to be there. So what we are doing, which is very, very different, is we are filling the gap between the needs that we hear firsthand on the ground from our friends and family and all of my volunteers are Ukrainians here in London or Ukrainians who are working remotely as far away at the moment as Barcelona, Spain, who have friends and family on the ground and what they're hearing and the needs that are coming up in conversations and the gap between what's needed and what's being delivered from foreign aid sources is really quite vast. Um, it's early days, of course, and the foreign aid workers are phenomenal at getting in and working and the risky, risky, horrible circumstances. But what Sunflower does is helps connect and bridge that gap to local, on the ground, sometimes very grassroots organizations that are actually doing the physical delivery of the aid or they're connected to the vulnerable people who really need it the most through their community. And while they're not formal NGOs, we do have roots and relationships we've built with formal NGOs in Ukraine, which I think, again, until two weeks ago, not many people were curious about or had the time or the language to build those relationships. And we've really focused on that. So how many people do you think have you now got in your whole network? Well, we have a network that's online and offline. <laughs> so the offline network is very immediate, and that's the team that's core team that's delivering all of these services. The online network is in hundreds of thousands of people. These are self-organized, not organized by us in any way, but we're tapping into it because it's almost like a ripple effect um, or a bit of like a, I don't know, like a probability tree. It starts with one person, they tell three others, they tell three others, and then people join these groups. Um, I mean, one of the uh, networks that we're sitting in has over a million people in one chat. Uh, and so there's quite a big interesting development that we're seeing that this is a smartphone wall and because there's this ability of sharing information in real time whether it's wayfinding or this road was blocked or here's a picture and a video of what's actually happening or here are you know 10,000 new children arriving in our district because they're displaced in the country that information is digital it's readily available but again it's all kind of on one side of the equation and not necessarily connecting directly to those who are working so so hard to deliver foreign aid into those communities on the ground. So how did you get the idea? I, I, I've never heard of anything like it before. And have you ever, is there a model that you've used? I mean, where did it come from and why did you suddenly, you know, how did you think of it? We had to think of something because, you know, it was such a shock to the system that suddenly a country that we thought was very safe and entirely modern by any standard um, needs very basic necessities. Pharmacies are shut. You can't really buy things. The first week, the banks weren't really operational. There was a run on banks, and it took about a week to 10 days for people to be able to get cash out again. So everything you take for granted, the fact that you wake up and you have a home that's not being attacked or shot at, the fact that you can go and use your cards or get cash out, the fact that shops are open and pharmacies are open, and you can travel without fearing for your life, all of that was gone overnight on the 24th. And it's increasingly worse and worse. So... I wasn't really focused on looking for a model. Initially, it was very personal, one-off activity with just the two hands and the two phones that I had. And that's what I heard from all of the Ukrainian volunteers who I've since met, who've been coming to my house to work here together. We were all doing individual things that we could to establish two things, reliable information, what's actually happening, and how can we help? Those are the questions we were asking. And if you imagine, you know, an asteroid striking your hometown, that's what you'd be asking your friends and family. What's actually happened and what do you need? What can I do? And so it's really it was about scaling this. When I spoke to some of my uh, colleagues in my peacetime CEO role as the CEO of Zamna, 
what they noticed is that not only was I constantly doing something that actually was on a very tiny, small scale, actually working to, to help certain things either be delivered or found or sourced, um, they noticed I was doing a lot of translation. And so what I brainstormed with a very small team of volunteers was the kind of functions that we were all doing individually. We were getting information or reliable eyewitness accounts out. So we've set up a media and production arm of Sunflower. We were also translating an awful lot because the linguistic barrier is quite significant. We set up a translator's function within Sunflower, and these are all volunteers too. And then we were organizing logistics for different purposes, but focused really on aid or sources of reliable information about aid and understanding the needs. So if you're sending aid and it's aimed at little kids, but it ends up in an old people's home, that's not very useful. Or if you're sending, uh, you know, as we said before, if, if you're sending bottled water, but actually what they really need is filters, because bottled water is finite, whereas a filter lasts much longer, then you're probably not meeting the exact need. That's not to say that brilliant foreign aid organisations won't meet those needs. It's just to say that the immediacy of the response needed was actually done by Ukrainians who were abroad and lucky enough not to be attacked in their beds at 5 a.m. So tell me some of those anecdotes that you've um, just mentioned, you know, some of the things that you've got on your um, section for, you know, eyewitness accounts. What what sort of things are you seeing on the ground? And, and what have you, you know, what has your work done to, you know, what have you delivered as well, if you can think of any examples of that? Yeah, I've got, I mean, I, I, I honestly, I don't collect success stories, if I'm honest, because I'm too busy delivering things and, and trying to connect people. But some of the most successful stuff at scale was actually 100% of this has been inbound requests, meaning people just heard that I was possibly could be quite helpful to their efforts. And they've connected from as far as California, uh, Milan, uh, we have a New York uh, case that's currently open, shipping and providing all sorts of different things, ranging from pharmaceutical supplies, which are really difficult to get through. And we've got a huge piece of work going on to that, to somebody who's donating several cases of warm gloves and hats to One of the states in the US had an official aid drive and they needed a cargo plane. And I was scouring my network for introductions to CEOs of the cargo department of airlines. And thanks to Zam, I was able to source those pretty quickly. Then there's, for example, um, some Italian aid that was coming out at a volume of 12 trucks a day. They then kind of run out of trucks and we sourced them some more trucks. Again, trucking companies I've never spoken to before, but because of the network and the immediacy of the need, the phenomenal humans in my network, both on LinkedIn and in my personal life, just would respond saying, oh, I saw you posted about this. Can we help? And it's simply doing what I can, which is putting my network to the in service of trying to connect the dots that are currently really, really disconnected. So give um, me an example, you know, for example, like the Romanian, was it Romanian orphanages? How did you get the, was it uh, baby milk to... Yeah. And, and and how did you get it through into the country and to where it needed to go and where did it need to go? Just one example or that's, another example. Yeah, that, that, that's actually, we've, we've got an open case with a Romanian charity. So there's a US donor giving to a Romanian charity that's then reconnected to the end recipient. It's almost three parts because a big donor is always going to be risk averse to giving to anything other than a charity, it's then the charity, the NGO's responsibility to do due diligence on the end recipient. And actually that's where we come in because we do due diligence on the end recipients. We verify them, we do calls in the local language, we look at the videos, we try and actually call somebody local to ask whether they're doing what they say they're doing. And then partnering with them, this is actually a schools network, not an orphanage network. The orphanage network you think of is another case you and I spoke of. But this schools network was run by a teacher And suddenly he went from not really having that many children to his schools being full of kids who've been displaced from cities and and villages in the east of Ukraine towards the west. So he's in a central west area. Um, And to be fair, he was uh, started off with his needs and he told us what it was that he now needed. And it was surprising how different it was to what we thought he needed. So we thought he needs, you know, baby formula, nappies, clothes. And he said, actually, the best way to think about it is camping gear. These kids are camping. If you think of donating anything or telling your network and friends and family what's needed, they're camping in the cold and their kids. So what would you pack for your children to go camping? And that's something that you just can't quickly imagine without speaking to somebody on the ground doing this. And so his head 
I don't know off the top of my head how many pallets of shipments, but it was a mix of clothes. There was some nappies because some of the children were very young. There was baby formula, but also food and baby food, not just for small babies, but kind of for older children. But there's also bottles. You can't just ship formula and no bottles. So little things like that on the ground are not things that I know. It's things that I'm listening and learning from all the time in order to serve better the needs of really the most vulnerable people who haven't been able to leave for whatever reason, or they're stuck in that conflict zone until they can finally make it out across the border and access more foreign support. So uh, has there been problems uh, actually with your logistics? Has there even been problems getting in through the borders? And what sort of problems have there been specifically? Um, there have been a lot of problems that I've heard about of other aid shipments getting through the borders between Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, or any of the adjacent countries to Ukraine. And this is because, especially if you're shipping large quantities or if it's pharmaceutical products or medical devices, the customs uh, regulatory kind of process is very complex. And unless you have a relationship, and again, it's all relationships, there's like little links in a chain. If you don't have an established relationship with a freight forwarding company, or you haven't kind of thought ahead of which forms you need to download and exactly which forms you need to fill in, that is going to create logistical problems. And aid will either get stuck in that way, in that process, which exists for good reasons, because it's things crossing country you know, boundaries, but it, again, if that's not thought about and the chain is not connected and turned, it's really difficult to actually get it to the people who need it the most. And in fairness, no one's needed to do it until two weeks ago. So there's such a fluid and ever-changing situation. As we learn more about little breaks in that chain, we assign caseworkers from Sunflower to own the entire end to chain. So with each shipment we do or each kind of case that we do where we've broken the relationship between the sender and the receiver, we're learning as well about some of the challenges that can come up. Yeah. Who to talk to? I didn't even know who freight forwarders were until recently. Now I have an entire list and catalogues of contacts that we can try to unblock processes with. But of course, it's different for every border. You have to kind of remember how very, very long that West European border is with Ukraine, with five different countries, all of them with different legislation. So it's a logistical and linguistic nightmare. But if not us, then who? We have to try and make it work. So you need linguists and you speak four languages, don't you? Is it? Uh... I, I, speak the, I speak the three local languages in English and I understand about five others. Uh, but the reality is I hadn't used my Ukrainian, Russian or Polish in many, many years. And it's very quickly that they've come back. These are now our working languages. But very importantly to say, Sunflower's business language is English. And so all our data structures are in English. Our process and our logistics are in English. And even the information that we collect, we always put English subtitles and videos to share with our networks because it's just the way to communicate and the way to make it structured so that anyone can access that is, is really important for our team. And tell me or tell us about your uh, your family because you have, as you said earlier, personal connections. Um, do you have kind of anecdotes about what's happening with them and, and you know, your grandparents, your father, your stepmother and your stepsisters? Um, just, you know, uh, examples of, you know, how they've communicated with you and, and the latest things as well. I'll start with my grandparents who are in their 90s and they have a WhatsApp on a large device, a large screen so they can see the buttons clearly. Um, I've been texting them on WhatsApp, calling them, and I've not been able to get through to them for the last three days. So I don't know what's happened. Either the power's out in the little village that they're in, um, or I don't want to think what else could happen. But it's taught me, this war has taught me that people do kind of go dark. They go offline for a little while because devices are really hard to keep going, especially if you're hiding in a basement from a bomb with no electrical sockets. So everything can happen. I've kind of suspended disbelief until I know otherwise. Um, and my grandparents um, are quite immobile. So my granddad had a stroke a few years ago and he's not be going to be able to make the journey even if he wanted to. And my grandma won't leave my granddad, her husband, after 70 odd years of marriage. And they are um, fairly remote. They have a little plot of land. They're not self-sufficient, but they went into town and they got some stuff on the first day that the war started on the 24th of February. And the last few messages were very emotional because for them, the memories of the Second World War are so fresh. And my grandma said, look, what's really disappointing is that we were born into a world at war 
and it looks like we might die in the middle of another war when we fought so hard for peace above our children's heads. And these peaceful skies was a big refrain of their generation, you know, never again. 1945 was a turning point. Europe will never be this dark again. And yet here they are in a dystopian nightmare of their own. My granddad is a decorated war veteran. He actually can't fit all his decorations on his um, on his uniform. And, and I have many, many memories of him telling us about this. And I think for them, it's a whole new level of grief that this is happening. And the hopelessness and the despair that comes with that is really quite poignant. Absolutely, yeah. And so they're not near your father and stepmother and stepsisters so, who are, uh, did you say, near... They're, unfortunately, my grandparents are in the south central part, yeah. south of Necro. Yeah. I think they're still there, is all I can say right now. And and so, as for your father and your stepsisters, when did you last hear from them? And what's their, what are the, what are the, what are the dialogues like? My my dad and I speak every day at the moment, and um, he's he's got a fairly responsible job. He's uh, helping keep the city's energy supply going, so he doesn't feel he can leave. He's over 70 now, uh, so he should be able to, you know, think about retirement maybe or something else. But he's determined to do his bit, do his duty. He's been making petrol bombs in his flat. using. Really? He's been joking, saying, I'm going to use all those bottles that I've drank brilliant liquor out of. Um, I've been I've been saving them up all these years. Now I'm going to either drink it or pour it out and put them to use to, to fight the enemy. He's been making uh, petrol bombs since day one. I actually had to look up what Molotov cocktails were because he sent me a voice note saying, I have a joke for you. I'm busy making cocktails. And I said, why? You don't like cocktails. He doesn't like cocktails. No, they're Molotov cocktails. Look it up. So I looked it up and I thought, really? Is it, has it come to that? But it has. It has. And so he's refusing to leave. And my stepsister and I were trying to persuade him to. And we don't think it's going to happen. So it's got so dangerous where they are in West Ukraine, which started coming under kind of direct fire from Sunday. Late last night, we kind of had a conversation and had to make a decision whether she was going to pack up and leave with her kids, her two small kids. They're two and seven. Your stepmom. Um, oh, yeah, your... My, my stepmom. And then, so this is my sister and then my stepmom. So the two women and the two little kids are going yeah. to leave, but they're leaving behind my dad and my stepbrother because of course he's fighting and he's in the army and it's just very I just spoke to her again before I came back to talk to you and it's just very hard because you just have to imagine walking around your house and thinking do I take this thing can I bring photographs do I what what do I take from my life it's not just packing on holidays I'm never going to see this again because things are going to get destroyed do, do I bring my pet? There was a meltdown from another very old friend of mine whose son just, he was five, he is five, and he wanted to carry his cat. They can't. I mean, you're abandoning your, in, everything you know, and you're doing it because the other option is staying and being killed in the night. We spoke earlier about the air raid sirens, you and I, and, and how not loud they are, because why would there be a system for loud warnings? Um, there was no need for it. And so they are just in the psychologically tortured state. They can't think clearly. Even packing, like I've been writing out packing lists so that she can think of like, this is what I need, this is what I don't need. She's like, I've got a frying pan. I'm like, honey, you don't need to bring a frying pan. No, but what if there's nothing there? And, and there's nothing there because you're going into an abyss. You're not going to a nice hotel you've booked. You're going into nothing is a really desperately difficult situation on top of the grief you've got from three weeks so last night overnight we were kind of sourcing some contacts on the ground we have some family in Slovakia thank the lord that we do we managed to get hold of them they managed to find a place that we think we can get my family into there's also somebody to meet them at the border it's just it's, it's just very sad and also very final there is no such thing as an intermediary stage it's like a permanent state of funeral and you don't actually know who's next to go and whether you'll ever see them again and and that's really hard it, it just is it's it's I, I can't imagine i mean it's it's yeah like like you say it's uh, torturous um does do you feel like you would want to persuade your father and stepbrother to leave or do you support them in their 
sort of bid to try and help? I think when you're an adult, you can't just be the child saying, but daddy, I want this. You have to treat them as an equal adult with their own ability to make decisions and what, what's right for one person isn't right for another. And it's, I'm full of admiration for what he's doing. I'm extremely worried because my father is as stubborn as I am. And I know that he's not going to let people do something that he thinks he can stand up against. And I'd be, I'll be honest, we've had that, we've had that call. I said, are you, are you prepared for the fact that we might not see each other again? And this is probably it if things get difficult. And he said, look, I was born on this land. You were born on this land. I've built my life here, not just money wise, but just my entire savings, my properties here. We have a house. He actually has a little country house. He, he owns the land. It's a bit like somebody saying to you, you know, are you going to stand up and fight for your home or not? When it's not just personal, but everything you've worked for in your life, then you do have something to lose. And even though I keep thinking, well, yes, but you might as well lose the property and keep your life. I think the way most Ukrainians are thinking is we are going to win eventually. But if all of us leave and decide we won't fight, then we definitely won't win. Does that make sense? So it's kind of, they feel like it's not an option. It's not no, a choice. No. It's just uh, something. Well, it's defeat. If you're leaving, you're giving up and it's defeat. Mm. A yeah. lot of people feel that strongly. Yeah. Um, I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, property and money, how is it functioning? It must be difficult. I mean, people can't earn money, presumably now. How How is the sort of trade working? You, you'll be amazed. The first week, it was just like the apocalypse. Everything froze, including, you know, the banking system. And then uh, about three or four days ago, it's been 10, 12 days in, um companies actually started paying people out um again banks started getting cash back into the atms it's really uh, i'd say fragmented and a bit uh, touch and go on whether that's happening but it is happening on the ground and so if i'm sending some money across for example to my friends and family or somebody who they flag to me as so and so is really struggling and they ask i mean they ask is such a microfinance ask a loaf of bread costs 50 pence in UK money. And so you're, you're sending kind of a few pounds, even 10 pounds is extraordinarily helpful. So I'll often send more if somebody's bank account is able to get them some cash and I'll say, we'll share it because I know they'll share it with their community and their friends and their family. People have had to kind of just pull together and share what little resource they have. So I have multiple apps on my phone that I've used before to send cash across and I have to call them, ask if their cards are working. If they're not working, what other apps do they have? Whether their bank card, if we are trying to send it to a bank, is that going to work for them to get the cash out? Um, and so it's very manual. You have to always check. And the first transaction I do is always like a little test to send a tiny bit just to see if that's gone through. If that goes through, then I can send a little bit more because the connection is established. It's just coming back, Lucy, to that broken chain links, right? We have to kind of test the chain before you put some stuff through it. And it's been what every single one of my Ukrainian friends in London has been doing, exactly the same. So a lot of people I know are perhaps creating another crisis, mini crisis, by just donating stuff. You know, people who are on um, sort of, you know, universal credit, just bringing coats and nappies and whatever and just putting them in community halls etc and, and I understand from disaster planners that that isn't helpful actually what you need to do is get aid to the people that know how to do aid including you so I don't know what you would say to people say to listeners about how they can help I mean obviously Sunflower you're looking for translators um, yeah, we, we are but you know there, there's two questions there how they can help our efforts in organising the really broken chain links. Um, that's a separate question. But I think just, just to pick up your point that you said, you're right. And I think you and I spoke about this before. My friend is a teacher in a very low income area of, of the UK. And there are people in universal credit who are taking things away from themselves and their children because they are compelled with empathy to help and God bless them that they are. But what I would say is it is almost your duty if you're giving to question whoever is receiving this, how are you making sure it's getting to the people who need it? Don't sit there and think, oh, I hope someone who really needs it gets it. Because that's what's missing in, is in my experience. People collect with the goodwill 
And then that end-to-end chain is not only not designed or thought through, but even the next step is not clear. So if somebody can say, okay, we've got a partnership with somebody who's taking it to Poland, do you question them and after, or is it going to Poland? Because if it is, fair enough. There's a lot of need for things in Poland right now. We've taken a volume of refugees, the equivalent of the whole city of Barcelona, 1.6 million at the last count and rising. So just this individual curiosity, how is it getting to the people who need it? Do you know who is going to end up getting this? Do you need help in it? That's the question that we can help answer. If you don't know where the aid is going, can we help? Because we can probably find you someone to partner with who is verified, vetted. If you must go to an NGO, we can also find your partner NGO, which we've been building a database of and being busy on the ground verifying with our volunteer work. And so if you need that help, please do reach out because getting aid to the people who need it is not the hard bit. It's making sure that you have committed and dedicated a tiny bit of time to actually having a goal. It's a bit like a project with no destination or a road going nowhere. If you don't have that end goal in mind or that destination in mind, it's really difficult to make sure that it gets there. Yeah, and we know from previous disasters that you know money's been filtered off to criminals and things get stolen and it is, it is a very messy process unless you know what you're doing and just looking at the logistics that you're trying to deal with you know petrol stations presumably aren't open transport links have been broke broken uh signs are down roads are blown up um and people's access to money is also t- disrupted or stopped um how how is it how is it working i mean is it are, you know are, are you facing these problems We at Sunflower, because we don't own the logistics, we don't own the trucks, we don't go A to B, we have to go with what's workable on the ground and just tap into that. There is a range of wayfinding groups and communities that actually advise on local things. There is a huge strength in us tapping into the local intelligence that already exists on the ground. And there's also a huge amount of people who are sharing not only their ability to do this logistics, but also a huge amount of people who already have a network. So, for example, one of our wonderful sunflower people who's actually in the office next to me right now, um, she's got a friend who has a network of logistics that existed before the war, and they were trucking uh, things between different shops within Ukraine. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. You don't need to parachute in and save people. They are highly capable with their own means of sourcing petrol, even from each other, as I've seen on the chats. You know, who's got something 95 or 97 who's got that? And they're highly capable and highly resourceful. What they do need is to be connected with sources of foreign aid at scale so that they can actually get it to those who need them. So it's never an unanswerable problem for those on the ground because that is their lives. They're there already. They know the area. It doesn't matter if one road goes missing. You just go around it. The trains have been doing the same, Lucy, instead of the main routes, which are now considered critical infrastructure and likely to be attacked. The trains are going in all these other secondary routes that normally they only use as backups or to park different carriages. So I think you have to then trust the Ukrainian people on the ground who are local to know their stuff, to do what they're doing, and they are extraordinarily intelligent and resourceful. So don't try and save them. They don't need saving, but they do need more resources and they do need to be heard. Thank you so much for joining us on Sketch Notes. Very, very inspiring. Um, if you want to help, perhaps you could say, you know, what people can do, what they can visit. Um, visit you at, is it Sunflower? Sunflowerrelief.org, all one word, lowercase. We also have a Ukrainian website in Ukraine, which is sunflower.in.ua. But sunflowerrelief.org is where you can do three things which is you can either donate financially if you want to support what we're doing. You can volunteer and fill in one of the forms, depending on how much time you have to donate to the cause. Or there's a way for you to just send us suggestions. If you think we should be talking to this logistics company or this clothes manufacturer or this company over here, or even an aid agency that's looking for highly vetted on the ground resources or NGOs to connect with and for relationships we can help with, then those are all there for you to tell us about. And we'll be very grateful for anything you can do to support us. I know you've had support from the Ukrainian Ministry of Health and also a letter today, I think, from Greg Greg Hans, the business secretary's office, uh, you know, indicating his support because you're in touch with him. So um, I hope it goes from strength to strength. And but I hope more than ever this 
war ends and uh, it, that's it it just must stop okay thank you so much for joining us today Ira and uh, wish you all the best and hope to follow up with you again um, but uh, in a happier place